Well, so thanks very much for inviting me to talk about this. Uh, it's um, a bit weird. 43 years on, I kind of forgot. Selective amnesia, I think they call it. I kind of forgot about it because it was quite dramatic at the time. But uh, anyway, so. Uh, <coughs> so, um, you can turn for this. Established in 1974. It was a new version of, uh, as I like to say, the Young Contemporaries, founded in 1949, which ran until 1969. The New Contemporaries consisted of a permanent committee of staff uh, from London colleges at the time, and it was run by a student committee. And its aim, and I think this is kind of key to this, its aim was to be a national student painting and sculpture show, as I remember it. So why did we run a live show in 1976, and why expand the show to include photography, film, performance, and video? You've already seen these slides uh, of Elaine's uh, image there. Uh, this was the poster that launched uh, the live show at the Acme Gallery, uh, May 31st, June 5th, 1976. Why? The, straight, the first and straightforward reason was that friends of mine, um, when I was at Goldsmiths, were, were producing some really interesting work on what I remember calling the back fields being taught by Michael Craig Martin. And I was really intrigued by what was going on there. And I just felt that that work needed to be seen, uh, and it certainly wasn't being seen in the new in the new contemporaries as had been. Now, I initially wanted to create one exhibition: of painting, sculpture, drawing, film, performance, video, and photography, not two. But as I remember it, and yeah, it was over 40 years ago, the permanent committee wanted to maintain the new contemporaries as just a painting and sculpture show. They weren't opposed per se, as I recall, to a third area, as it was called then, but said it had to be a separate project. So I arranged the painting and sculpture show at the New, New, New International Arts Centre in uh, Elmfield Castle, and then had to organise at short notice a venue, a new group of selectors and a student committee for what we called the live show. So Ron Hazel and Stuart Brisley, John Hilly, the selectors, they were really helpful and generous, and put me in touch with Jonathan Harvey and David... Uh, Panton and Acme, who agreed to host the show. And my colleague Andy Whitten, some of my friends working on the backfields, and, and he and I worked together on the project. And in a new departure from the painting and sculpture show, we decided to include recent graduates in the live show, and I'll touch upon that uh, a little bit later on. But there were, of course, other contextual reasons why the show, I think, was relevant for 1976. In popular recollection, would you believe the 1970s have gone down as the dark ages, mm -hmm. Britain's gloomiest period since the Second World War? Well, it may be that in the aftermath of Brexit, our current decade will herald the period of even greater crisis. And I don't think um, mine, I think it almost certainly will. In the 1970s, there was trade union unrest, mm -hmm. uh, which ended the decade with the winter of discontent. The troubles in Northern Ireland escalated when the provisional IRA's December 74 ceasefire ended. And in early 76, we had a return to violence. There was also the troubling rise, again, kind of mirroring what's going on now, the troubling rise of the National Front during this period. In the mid-1970s, it was briefly the UK's fourth largest party in terms of vote share. And its public profile was raised through street marches and rallies, which often resulted in clashes with anti-fascist protesters, most notably the 74 Red Lion Square disorders and the 77 Battle of Lewisham, which I remember horribly. And 1976 was also, of course, and not unrelated, the year that launched punk in the UK. So it was against this backdrop that selection for the live show took place in the Acme Gallery as the gallery was being built. All those who applied were invited for interview and they came from all over the country. We were so impressed with the standard and commitment to the project by applicants that I think, if I remember, we included everyone who came to the gallery over a two, three day period interview um, time. And it was really exciting. It was, it was a very exciting period. Our show, the live show, was the second show at uh, the Acme Gallery. They had um, a kind of day opening with Robert Yance's Six Lines, then Mike Porter's show, and then we had the New Contemporaries on for two weeks. A week of rehearsals and a week of performances at the Acme Gallery. I... Uh, as I say, selected amnesia, I'd almost forgotten that we did a catalogue. I now remember um, printing this catalogue, finishing it at about, and stapling it at about 3 o'clock in the morning before we opened at 9 o'clock, so it's probably why I forgot about it. Um, I just want to read um, some of, of the statement that we, we uh, put together at the time. 
Uh, so, preface to the 76 show. First time the New Contemporaries opened its entry to all areas of study at present undertaken by students in fine art. The decision precipitated much discussion of the relevance of non-object based versus object oriented visual activity. It should therefore be explained that the show is not an attempt to demonstrate that live work as a field of visual expression is more important today than either painting or sculpture. It in fact indicates that all areas are valid fine art forms. However, we feel that our exhibition can only suffer by categorization on this level. A, a student should be open to visual stimuli, and I would not now say visual, but stimuli of any kind. And while it is true that live work has recently received the customary avant-garde bandwagon exposure, students feel the need to establish a serious intellectual and emotional basis for their work, and we shall endeavor to promote this aspect of the arts during our show. The expansion of the association's facilities has been made possible by well, all the usual thing that I still would say. Thank you very much, Arts Council. Thank you very much for funding us. Um, the show, which opened on the 31st of May, runs to the 5th of June, covers a broad spectrum of expression. Work includes photographs, slide projections, remember slides, slide projections, uh, drawings, written documentation, films, and we had some lovely Super 8 16mm films, video performance. Artists have been encouraged to show evidence of more than one piece of work. That was important. And where necessary, discuss the nature of the medium in which they are involved. The organisation is flexible enough to allow for constant change and assessment throughout the week. Seminars will be held every afternoon and encourage the development of themes discovered as a consequence of working in a new situation. Furthermore, the week of rehearsals is an important innovation and artists should make the poss fullest possible use of this facility to ensure that the week ran smoothly. Uh, the establishment of the show has revealed, this is quite interesting, certain weaknesses in the general organisation of the new contemporaries, and hopefully the lessons learned this year can be made use of in future years. Um, so there are five things that stand out for me and remain a constant over the years in the running of this project. It was student-led, so it was a project that went from the ground up. It was a learning experience for everyone involved, as well as a showcase for their work, and I think that was really important. A week of rehearsals helped to bond those that were there. There was a sense of shared commitment to what we were doing, collaboration rather than competition. And those standards were very high, and everyone was testing themselves against each other at the same time. So you can have both. You can have collaboration, you can have a shared commitment, but you can also have high standards, and you can test each other out. The inclusion of recent graduates was important because it allowed, allowed for a sharing of experience between students and those who'd left college. That's right. The focus of the body as an expressive medium was key. And this has cropped up a few times today. As David Howe says in The Empire of the Senses, the senses expressed directly through the body are not just one more field of potential study alongside, say, gender, colonialism or material culture. The senses are the media through which we experience and make sense of gender colonialism and material culture. I'll just run through one or two of the um, images from the catalogue <coughs> and see the artists that were involved. Photograph taken by a cat for the way you look. The key thing was the kind of, I think, the sense of activity that was going on. Week of rehearsals, and then during the week, you'd start, um, you, you'd have things going on all day uh, and all evening in both the lower gallery and the upper gallery. Tuesday, you had rehearsals. Then in the upper gallery, you'd have uh, the architecture group, and then in the evening, you got on the on the on the right hand side there, you got an evening of events which finished around midnight very often. So there was kind of sense of activity from early in the morning, right the way through to midnight. And there were over there were over fifty artists involved, probably over sixty actually if you take if you think of Ting and uh, and reindeer work. And I think um, you'd ask me to think about the title live as well, where did that come from? So I was trying to remember the discussions we had, Ron uh, Stewart, Jonathan, David, John around this. Um, and I 
put together the meaning of live, uh, looked at the thesaurus. It would be interesting to know what it said then, actually, but I think it's quite relevant now. It says, unsettled, controversial, current, dynamic, topical, vital, survive, which you've got like continue. And this one, I think, is really important. Breath, breathe. I think that's kind of key, in a way, to what was going on. We had a pretty good review in Studio International by Pete Dunn, who actually spent the week at the performances, so he didn't just come in and out, but he stayed around and talked to the uh, artists. So what happened next? Before leaving in 76, because I'd had, I had to start from scratch on it, um, the uh, show at Camden Arts Centre that happened the year before, they decided they didn't want to write again. So I managed to get the painting and sculpture show at the Royal Academy, and the live show remained at Acme Gallery. Uh, in 77. And then in 78, I became gallery manager of the ICA. So I could, with, support, with the support of Bill McAllister, bring the new contemporaries to the ICA, merging the painting and sculpture show with the live show all under one roof, which is what being kind of the aim really two years ago, two years before. So you can now see on the right hand side, you don't have two different uh, selection panels or permanent committees. Everyone, it, it's all together, all the same one, and I think that was absolutely key. And then again for a new contemporary show in 1979, I, I was there at the ICA from 78, 79, when I left in 1980. Moving forward 10 years, so the influence of that live show continued with me. Um, when I uh, got the job working as, uh, at the Lane Art Gallery in Newcastle, I set up working collaboratively with uh, John and Simon at Project UK, uh, John Bewley, Simon Herbert. We did three years of new work Newcastle. Again, we showed around, coming up to 60 artists over three years uh, of, of uh, performances. This is a, this is, um, uh, a photograph of uh, Simon Herbert's uh, performance. That was from them. We also did a, a, a kind of contextual exhibition called Confrontations, the role of controversy in art, which we toured as well. This was Nigel Roth's performance, uh, The Rope That Binds Us set, Sets Us Free. I'd, lo I'd love to spend more time talking about these brilliant performances. Uh, Bruce McLean and David Ward, uh, Sylvia Zoranek. Alistair, whoops. Alistair and Stuart. Alistair, you might want to talk about this later. This was a week long duration performance, wasn't it? In the and Stuart Brisley took up residence in Helmsley Road in, uh, in Fenham as well. So 10 years on from that, uh, 20 years on actually, I was approached by curator Sophia Howe, who had discovered information about New York, Newcastle and the basement of the land. And in a spirit of generosity typical of Sophia, she asked if I wanted to be involved in a project she called Notes on a Return, which paired artists emerging with artists who have been involved in New York, Newcastle. So again, collaboration embodied in context, learning from each other, the same kind of principles that go back to 1976. And we have some quite good um, coverage for this, a glimpse into the lion's racy past, etc., etc., the usual stuff you might get. But it was quite good coverage, actually, it was quite fair. Good. So you can see that uh, we have Rose English, or uh, Sophia had Rose English, Bruce McLean, Nigel Wolf, Anne Bean, Mona, Hartoon. And then there were, um, there were younger artists. I, I hesitate to use the word younger because um, you could be a young artist in the 50s if you're just starting to work. So artists who were emerging or were beginning their practice were paired with these artists. Ran at um, a symposium, which is a really good interactive symposium that was engaged everybody. It wasn't just uh, about talking to them. Just those Bruce. You can't imagine Bruce just talking to you. And five years on again, so we're up to now 2014. Again, here's, Al here's Alistair. Again, you might want to talk about this later, Alistair. Uh, so in 2014. Curator Essen Kai, and, and Essen's now curator at uh, the Albert Khan Centre just down the road here. Uh, Sandra Johnson and I organised a weekend uh, of drawing with the body, and we call that drafting. Um, yeah, organised. Well, it, to be honest, I was probably 
my term might more correctly be called a sous chef, and I'll tell you why in a minute. So we had workshops, rehearsals, we had workshops, uh, rehearsals in the morning, workshops in the morning, afternoon, evening performances, symposium. It included students from foundation through to PhD students, artists at all levels of their career. And when I say I was a sous chef, we started off in the morning with breakfast. Everybody started with breakfast, so Essen was a good cook. I prepared all the, all the food. Then we had dinner uh, after, after the rehearsals and, and workshops in the morning. I, made, I prepared the vegetables, Essen cooked the food. And then we had the evening performances and had wine and a proper evening meal. And I, did, I, did the, I did all the preparation and Essen for the cooking. But it's really, I think it was really important, that sense of getting together. Food is a really good thing as well, I think, and you kind of get people together. It's not just a drink, it's actually a food, I think, as much as anything. It gets people talking and, and getting ideas flowing. So, what of today? Well, I try to teach my students that collaboration is a skill. That we need to work with each other and not compete with each other. With each other that we learn together. In the context, we need to better understand our complex relationship to a more human world. We've got to value the whole world as a living ecology of cultural differences. We've got to invent a narrative to supersede neoliberalism, which is a powerfully argued story that is alienating and trapping us. As George Monbiot says in his new book, Out of the Wreckage, Currently, for mainstream economics, the living planet is an afterthought, or at worst, a prayer along the lines of, Dear God, invisible hands, spirit of Friedrich Hayek, who is Thatcher's guiding spirit, may our quest for endless economic growth somehow coexist with a viable future for the world's living systems and the people who depend on them. I've got no idea how this might happen, but the economy works in mysterious ways. Amen. Oh, P.S., don't worry if you've got too much on. It's not such a big deal. Thanks very much. Okay, so I'm Emily and I started doing my PhD with Nottingham Trent and New Contemporaries a couple of years ago. Um, and actually I'm kind of building on what Alex and Mike have both talked about. But I thought I'd start by just talking a little bit about my research and where I began. Although apart from <coughs> it's disappeared. This one. Um, so, um, so my PhD started as an inquiry to the New Contemporaries Archive and their organisational history as situated within the contemporary. It's been challenging in the New Contemporaries for having second seven decades of history and clearly a significant role in the British art scene. There isn't a singular archive. Instead, it's much like the organisation itself. It is embedded within the organisations and institutions who have supported it and hosted it. It is memorabilia kept by past participants and organisers. And most particularly, it is with the people as a collective oral history. And it's with specific people, Sasha being a case in point. And upon meeting her, it was stunning how much information she has about every participant over the last 30 years and for the majority she still knows exactly what they were doing and what they went on to do. For the earlier history, prior to 1989, it is a little more difficult and slippery to track down. New Contemporaries is one of those entities which is dispersed and ephemeral and has equally carved a very significant and indelible mark within the British arts landscape. It's hard to extrapolate and make sense of it as it is so massive and so enmeshed within the British arts scene and as Alex spoke of, it plays a clear role in the professionalisation of artists, but it is also parallel to the experience for the organisation itself. New Contemporaries records are actually held in several locations. It's at the Blythe House at the BNA, who hold records relating to the Arts Council. It's at the Tate Archive, who have records relating to the ICA. And it's the materials in the current New Contemporaries offices um, for records 89 onwards. So there isn't actually one archive for the show. So much of my research has been looking at what materials are there, where are they, and who owns them? And then, more importantly, what could an archive, a singular archive, for new contemporaries be? What would it look like? What would it do for them? And what would they do with it? And does it need to be a physical archive or something else? 
My own initial interest for the project came in working in artist residencies programmes, where I worked particularly with a lot of students and early career artists. And in 2015, while working for the Edinburgh Art Festival, I also curated their inaugural platform exhibition, a new programme dedicated to supporting artists at the start of their career. Having graduated in fine art myself in 2007, I did put in my own unsuccessful application to new contemporaries. Um, the anxieties and difficulties in establishing a career outside of art school are familiar to me, and I recognise that for many artists at this moment, their work is still extremely fluid and porous. And as so wonderfully put by Andrew Forge in 1962, one knows that it is on the cards that X, the author of the most spectacular picture in the show, may not turn out to be an artist at all. At the same time, one knows that perhaps the student whose staying power and creativity is strongest, whose relationship with the art is most assured, may have a picture which is so laboured or awkward or pedestrian that it was an embarrassment to the hanging committee and had to be tucked away in a corner. In many cases, the work during this period that they are showing in new contemporaries or young contemporaries is extremely experimental, sometimes derivative, but it is a way stop as they establish their own voice and their practices develop. Often the artist in question may delve into an area or medium that they will never repeat again. For example, artists such as Anthony Gormley, whose work is so immediately identifiable, when he participated in the New Contemporaries in 76 and 77, he presented a film work and performance work respectively. I found an interview online in which he mentions this fleeting practice, which I have now lost, so if anyone finds it, please tell me. Um, but it was, remained an area of brief experimentation rather than becoming a core part of his practice. Gormley is not alone. For example, artist Terry Shave, who spent his undergraduate years in the painting studio, spent his masters making film works before returning to his career as a painter. And this is where I am going to talk a little bit about, how do I go to the next one? You can just press the arrows as well if you uh, A project I did last spring. So I started um, at, just before I started my PhD, I was working with Sophia Howe up in Dundee. Um, she's been quite inspirational in how I approached the project. And she was friends with Mike, obviously. Um, and uh, so I went and had a two hour long conversation with Mike in his studio in Newcastle, um, as Mike has talked about. And I decided that I wanted to see what it would be like if I managed to actually track down the material from this show and put it all in one space. So the two shows in 76 and 77. Um, the separate format only lasted for these two specific years became, before it became absorbed back into the main show. Hints of this type of work, have, as been mentioned before, were already apparent earlier on, and the 69 show particularly had a darkened room section for projected works. However, the ambition to have ongoing performance and film programme alongside the main show was push the new contemporaries to redefine its parameters. As Mike said, until this point its articles of association stated it was painting and sculpture only, and now it was redrafted to include third area. However, this ongoing concern around um, installation, performance, and what is now socially engaged practice is still something that finds, struggles to find its footing. Even today, as the show pushed to decentralize from London and moves to different venues, such as Leeds Art Gallery this year, the mobility of work means that incorporating performative or socially engaged practice is still logistically extremely problematic. However, working with just these two exhibitions allowed a much closer reading of what was happening, who was involved, and how new contemporaries impacts a wider art scene. Seen just in the conversations that have been had here today, in the expanding practice, feminist works, film, diversity, the increased link, and the reaction to an increasingly commercialised culture. And it is a push away from work that can be easily monetized. And as mentioned by Alice, <coughs> this is also the idea of monetary success being a poison chalice. The catalogue that Mike produced for the show was actually probably the most complete uh, set of material that I have for what was actually happening in the exhibitions. The other catalogues are much like the catalogue that he showed for the 77 show, which just has a list of names, often without even the title of the work or what the medium is. But for this one show, uh, Mike's very 
very last minute cobbling together of the catalogue, there's actually the proposals from each artist, so it's amazing to see them. Um, and when I tried to put this work together, it both demonstrated how much material is in the New Contemporaries archive, how many things can be discussed, how many things can be uncovered and connections made, um, but also showed how little material there is that exists from this period. So um, uh, this wallpaper is actually the sheets, the proposals from each art artist that were in that catalogue. And then I had interviewed Mike, um, Terry Duffy, who was in the 77 show and 76, and he remembers the, um, the process to get in the show a little bit differently to Mike. <laughs> he said that actually it was a very scary interview process. He went down to London from Liverpool, um, and there was a, a, a row of uh, selectors sitting in front, and he had to go and perform his work to them. He said, not everyone got in, but Mike says everyone did, so I think everyone did. interesting to hear that. Um, and Terry Shave. And actually, I worked with Terry Shave for this show. I did um, a live art show evening, much like James McKay organised with um, the London Film Court for the show. And I showed a new selection of work from contemporary emerging artists alongside work from Terry Shave and Helen Chadwick, who'd been in the show, and Jenny Oaken. And we'd got out Terry's work, luckily he'd kept it in his house because his studio caught on fire, most of his work was destroyed, but the work for New Contemporaries he'd kept, and it was a 16mm film where he'd spent, he said it was three weeks in a room which just contained a photocopier, and he was um, photocopying over and over and over again a postcard, so he was just playing with material and technology, um, and he worked on this for about six months putting it together and it was the first time it had been shown in 30 years and we spent about three hours working out how a 16mm projector works and how to spool it correctly. But it was amazing to see a piece of work that hadn't been shown for so long. Um, and so you can see here the interviews and most of what was discussed around that point was also the fact that although this was happening in the contemporary art world and artists were practicing it, especially in Covent Garden and Camden where these two events were taking place, the um, film screenings in Camden and the live show at Acme Galleries in Covent Garden, the actual activity happening in arts education was quite different. We talked about it earlier, actually it was quite traditional in the education, but the artists that were teaching and the young students were much more experimental. But there was really very little in way of material. There's a couple of articles, and then I was given a few photographs by um, Terry Duffy. And I know that the ones towards this end were Terry's work, but I also have quite a few mystery photographs. Um, let me move on. In this one, um, the people playing a game, I'm not quite sure what they're doing. Uh, this one, I have no idea what this is. This one, this one. So uh, I have some mystery photographs. How do I go backwards? The only one I could figure out was the art of Charlie Process because he tells us um, that he, uh, Terry remembered that he brought in a fresh bunch of flowers every day, and he helpfully titled his work in the picture. Um, so there is both a lot of material and very little, and I tried to represent this as well by typing up and presenting all of the information that I had of who they were, where they came from, what the title of their work was, and then during the show I tried to fill in more information, and you can see there's very little filled in, and it's actually really difficult to do. Um, and also you can see how relationships continue. Mike talks about working with Sylvia Zernick later on and Stuart Grizzly and others. And I think um, just to go back to the PhD, my PhD has been a twofold or parallel process, an exploration of the archive and its potential and what it might do or could be for new contemporaries. And new contemporaries' reflexive relationship to the idea of the contemporary. Its very nature reflects much of what it is to be in our current postmodern understanding of the contemporary. 
very much from the idea of the now of the 20th century to the contemporaneity or untimeliness of the 21st, such as spoken about so eloquently by Edwin. If archives could have waves, then I would say this is at the point at which the archive in its current vernacular and its interpretation has become synonymous with embodiment of contemporaneity. And I think for me, um, it's particularly about how the interpretation and reinterpretation of material and the representation and re-representation becomes enmeshed and entwined with its contemporary moment. So what we're discussing here today, as much as the past, is actually what's happening right now. And just to finish off, I feel like the live shows in particular mark a point at which the new contemporaries is clearly oscillating in this reciprocal space. It's responding to a changing art scene and art students wanting to try new things. And it's actually in this paradox that the formal side of education actually lags behind. Students are influenced by tutors and the art scene, and they're both copying and pushing forward. And that you weren't moving forward, and that there's still a bit of me that you know, like to think in 2019 and not 1976. However, there are also some things, it's also interesting looking back, and there are some things that I do think, um, I do remember and think are important, and I mentioned some of them in, in the slides. I mean, I think that working together, I think learning from each other, I think you know, being aware of what the issues are, and I, I, did, like, I did like the fact, remembering back, that we did make available all the artists' proposals and they were there to talk about them to people who, who came as well, which I think was really important because it was a, a difficult uh, area to be working in at the time. Um, although I also do remember, Elaine, I don't know if I ever shared this with you, but um, I did have a visit from the Couple Garden um, Associ what is it, Housing Association, which I was saying, that they, they really didn't like the poster because they thought I was bringing Soho into Covent Garden, actually, which was a bit of a shock, I've got to say, because it was obviously not going to be that at all. Well, I got, um, I got all sorts of phone calls um, asking me if I would do whipping sessions and <laughs> <laughs> sessions, so you got off lightly. <laughs> just, <laughs> just supposed to show how things to be. The, uh, actually, the other thing I do, especially looking at your, your presentation, and I was aware of this when I was putting this together, if you look at the list of, of Selectors. And there wasn't one female selector in there. Yeah. And if you look at the, uh, 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 there was actually a, a better gender representation within the show 
but um, yeah, it's, it's really, it really kind of stands out when you. Yeah, still, there was definitely more women showing film actually, um, and even though Chadwick, although it was a performance, it was a film, so there was definitely more women showing film rather than performing in that space. Yeah. Um, and then also I think that going back to that idea of like not keeping things or um, it feels like it represents quite a lot of that move into the importance of now within the 20th century art practice. Like you see it changing in the 60s, the material changes and things don't last as long with the touring show, particularly the damage reports when you start going through the roof because material becomes more difficult to move once it stops being oil painting or wood or stone sculpture. Um, and also, yeah, in the change in materials and performance, the concentration is all about that moment. And so the shift into now being a really dominant and important aspect, um, which I think has changed. And I guess you come into the 21st century and the proliferation of being able to document everything <laughs> but and so our attitudes towards the now has shifted, like it's now much more um, this idea of kind of untimely, so being in and out of time at the same time, like everything's all happening on the horizontal plane. Yeah. Whereas at that moment, it was really about what was happening as you did it. Yeah, I think I was just, uh, the things I was just talking about are interesting though, because the, the, at that time, there was, uh, I mean, Kevin, you'll probably remember this, uh, you know, if you, if you think back to the 60s and the, the Coldstream Report in the 60s, which began to academicize, uh, I mean, for all the right reasons in a way, it wanted to value what artists were doing. And not, I mean, I, I couldn't do art at Aylan because it wasn't regarded as a proper subject. You know? So, I mean, there was that, sh trying to get that shift there. Um, but, uh, at the same time, it, it, I think it did have an impact on what, on what was actually being taught and how it was being taught. So I think an awareness of the history of where you're coming from is always is, is, is always useful and always important. And I think particularly now, when we and again I'm going back to this thing, because I, th I think the mess we do with climate change, we're all not really. So I think it, we need to think about where where we've come from and what we've done in order to make sure that we can actually do something rather than just put it on films and talk about it. Okay, so this is just an interesting question. Like the idea of history is different to the keeping of objects. It's like the idea of constructing narratives. So there was the importance of history, but then in art practice, kind of the longevity of thinking <coughs> forward about uh, materials that last But also in terms of you know, constructing history, it's quite striking when you have a really good list on the wall with all the gaps. How, in some ways, that seems like a very fitting kind of archive of an exhibition where, because these exhibitions, as, as the Anthony Forge quotation show, like that, you know, there is a, a certain kind of um, entropy people fall away. There are only some who persist. James goes. You were in 1977, <laughs> weren't you? I think yeah. I didn't realise that until I was looking through this. But uh, don't come. Yeah. Thank you. 
you know, dealing with the past. And I thought your show, I mean, you should say a bit more about that show. Because it looked great. Show, the show of the Victory Gallery. Yeah. So it's just a small space in uh, Nottingham Trent University. They have a victory space outside the main gallery. So they concentrate on kind of archival oriented exhibitions. But I guess also because it was really about my research as opposed to trying to reconstruct the show. Um, so I had the three oral histories from uh, Mike, Terry Shane, and Terry Duffy. Um, but it became actually me typing out the transcripts of the conversations um, rather than actually playing the audio. And yeah, I don't know what else to say. Yeah. <laughs> I mean, very I, fragmented. I, I'll just say a couple of things. Yeah. Just about, I, I, you know, memories of, of work from the show at, at the ICA. Um, I remember two, and I, I, I remember, and it's interesting actually, because I can't remember the names of one of them. And I don't even know whether I've kind of romanticised and invented one of these pieces, because I've kind of used it partly in the pieces I've been doing at the One was, I do remember, it was a guy called Robin Morrison, and he did this beautiful piece, which was, uh, he was from the, from the fence, from the Sandia, and it was a Super 8 loop camera which rotates at 360 degrees and he created this 360 degree um, film like butcher's paper. And so the camera just turned around and round and just flat on the camera. It was absolutely beautiful. Um, and the other one was two two it was um, the, the I think it was two guys from uh, who photographed uh, the night sky from Ali Pali and then had, had made uh, a score out of it and then played it on the jello two jellos. In the ICA. It was absolutely gorgeous. It was really lovely. I mean, it was quite kind of distant at times, but a fantastic piece. That was New Contemporaries at the ICA, yeah. Oh, the other thing I remember talking about at the uh, interviews, Marty St. James, first time I'd ever met Marty, he came and interviewed. And I don't remember it being quite as formal as that, but perhaps it was. But anyway, he certainly broke, down, broke it down, because as he was leaving, when the door opened, he had this, he, he made this coat, and he ripped it open and just said, fuck off. And then turn it around and went down the stairs. That was the first time I've met him. Yeah, I think going back to the idea of kind of making something new, I think one of the nicest things about doing that show was the live. Um, we did the film screen at the end, and I, that's also I think part of this ongoing. There were discussion programs and symposiums throughout, but it seems to have particularly picked up around the point at which the live shows were introduced and then moved to ICA, there was lots of seminar programs and discussions alongside the show. Um, but we did this film screenings and it was artists now, one of them who's actually in the show this year, George, I can never remember his name. Stemanoff. Stemanoff. Um, alongside lots of other things, but also some of the shows, films from that point. And I think what's really nice that you saw it in Elaine and Laura earlier, there's lots of um, experimentation and repetition and reworking over the, like, these ideas and forms and shapes and moving technology. So there's, although it's always moving forward, there's also kind of this um, reciprocal dialogue um, happening across generations. I think the learning process is, is, is really important. It's not just about showing things, but it's about um, learning. That's what was really important when we did, what we did I think, was that, yes, you were showing things, and as I say, you were, te you, you were testing to them. What's happening every day, but we were also sharing information, learning from each other, and developing. So it was an educational experience as well as a, 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 as a place to, to share things. Yeah. Um, can, can you speak into the microphone? Oh, sorry. Originally, it's showing it in the university context, but good. Um, and one thing that I, I didn't mention was the, was the sort of close relationship between. Um, more of an ideological relationship between education and display, uh, which these, these exhibitions foreground. Yeah. Um, and you can see, I don't know, that was never really taken up anywhere else except for us being um, the Lumaris as an international show. So yeah. the University Gallery was a good purpose for exhibition. Um, oh, what the exhibition taking place in? Yes, well, yes, in, a, in an actually pedagogic space. Yeah. Um, well, I think the most of the new contemporaries, I think the purpose was to be outside 
the institution against that first move away from being in an institutional context. But it was interesting showing what the live show was then to students and actually having conversations with them about the types of work that were in the live show then and what they were doing now. It was quite interesting um, conversations and things that they hadn't been aware of um, in kind of artists and what artists are doing and um, yeah, practice that they do now. Are there any, are there, oh, look, there's loads of questions. Elaine and Leah, um, I've got one. Yeah. Just, it's more of a comment, really, that, um, of course, that 1976 uh, New Contemporary show followed on, in a way, from the 1975 video um, show at the Serpentine. And that, um, that gave the opportunity for um, a lot of young women to show videos in the Serpentine and also might have encouraged or given them the confidence to apply to the New Contemporaries yeah. show in 76. Yeah. I don't know if you would agree with that. Yeah, I would actually. Absolutely. Absolutely. And then also going on around the London Film Cup around that time mm. as well. Chris Larsby was quite centrally involved. Um, that, was, that was really important. Actually, I was just thinking, just before the last thing quickly, about um, do documentation and history of things. It's quite interesting. You were talking about everything's video now, and all that thing. everything's recorded digitally. If we had a crash now, we'd all go. <laughs> yeah. I, mean, I, I remember um, trying to resurrect one of Vito Conchi's early pieces for the Time International video piece from um, the the late 60s, and he's in such a mess. And you, I remember when video first came, we think that would last for years, for hundreds of years. So we, we are in debt, we could lose all this information because it's not recording at all. We could just go like that. Very much. We've got, we've got one last question okay. from the floor. So I was really interested um, in the, the live show was a separate kind of program, mm -hmm. um, and then it kind of made its transition into becoming part of the wider um, new contemporary. I wonder if you felt that that kind of affected maybe the content and the way that artists were making or the way the work's being received at all. From going not, from not something the, which was quite specific yeah. into something which was uh, potentially more interdisciplinary. I don't think so at the ICA, Leah. I don't know what happened after that. I mean, I, I left the ICA in 1980 and I can't remember. I, I was like, I genuinely no idea. I thought it was a really good idea that they came together because I felt like live work or third area, and that itself is a, is a kind of large term, isn't it? I mean, it, it, it was kind of marginalised, really. That was not that I thought was really wrong. Um, but I think, as, as you pointed out, and as pointed out, especially if it's on tour, that sense of a community work together, of learning, of, of sharing, of, you know, so all that kind of thing becomes more difficult. The actually is really good, though, actually, because you have you had the theatre space, you had the film, you, you could do things in the gallery. It was quite, it was quite kind of, um, it was reasonably an at that time. So you could, uh, you know, I'm not, I'm not, I don't, I don't really know what you're saying. Yeah, I, I know what you're saying. I mean, I, I, I think, I, I think like, my, my sense would be, ideally, I think they should go, I don't like that sense of them, of, of them being split. And um, I think that it, it with it, and I can see it bring to their problems in the same <coughs> energy and that learning space that you can have with a live show is more difficult to realise than it is today. But it shouldn't make it impossible. And why can't circuits and places have that kind of energy and dialogue and workshop situation? Why does it just have to be people working in that work? I mean, I was a painter. I mean, I wasn't in that last time I was you're talking about 76 and 77. Then in 78, I was a selector of what was then called performance stroke concept group. Yeah. As if all the people were devoid of a performance of both conceptual dimension. So it, it's interesting to hear what you're saying because if we followed on, if that year followed on from your year, there was absolutely, as I remember, no contact between the different selectors. We selected without regard to the final show. 
Yeah, I suppose the innovation was it was actually showing where everything was together. Yeah, but I, I, accept, I absolutely, I, absolutely, there was still, I mean, I think there was still a residue of the permanent <laughs> then. I mean, it was set up to be a painting and sculpture show, and there was real resistance to to it being anything else. Yeah, that's what. And to be fair, I mean, that's what it was set up to do. I mean, when you, if you come in and say, actually, I think it was yes, then you know, you come back and you try to Great, okay, thank you very much. Um, we're going to take a break.